Welcome friends from across the country. I just wanna thank you for being with us tonight. I just wanna take a moment to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jean-Nicole. We're very happy to have you. Uh, Dr. Jean-Nicole Mellon St. Laurent. I actually met her at the Maronite Enrichment Day in DC last month. And I asked her if she would be willing to come and speak to our ladies group. And she graciously said yes. And I thought, why not open this up? So I'm happy that we can have others to join and really benefit from your research, Dr. Nicole or Dr. Jean Nicole, and just to be able to get to know you personally too and the beautiful work that you're doing. So regarding the topic, we, we have a topic on Mary and the saints and especially from our Syriac tradition. I think it's really important for us to appreciate the treasures that we do have and a little bit about uh, Dr. Jean-Nicole's uh, background. She is an Associate Professor of Historical Theology and Syriac Patristics at Marquette University. She is the author of Missionary Stories and the Formation of Syriac Churches, The History of Mar Ben Nam and Sarah, Martyrdom and Monasticism in Medieval Iraq, Iraq with Carl Smith, and an Associate Editor of Syriac.org or Syriaca, I should say, .org, a digital portal for Syriac studies. She is active in the field of digital humanities and the study of early Christianity. Above all of this, she's a beloved mother and wife, and she has two beautiful children. So we welcome you, Dr. Jean-Nicole, and thank you for your time and your generosity. So it's really a blessing to have you, and I'm sure all of our listeners are gonna benefit tremendously. Thank you, sister. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. It is uh, a delight and an honor to be with you, uh, wonderful people this evening, um, speaking about all the things that I love. Um, and and uh, I just really am grateful for the invitation um, to share with you. And I um, have been working in the field of Syriac studies uh, since I was a graduate student um, many, many years ago. And actually, I've always had a special place in my heart for the Maronite tradition. My first Syriac teacher was a Maronite priest, uh, Father Joseph Amar. Um, and so uh, it's really an honor to be with you all tonight um, and that you would welcome my thoughts and, and so on and so forth. I, I have a, a great love of the study of the saints in the church. Um, that's what I've focused a lot on in my own work. And um, I'm convinced, you know, there's many ways that people study the saints' lives. They can study them as a lens into cultures of the past, or they can study them as from a devotional theological side as models of, of discipleship, or a little bit of both. Um, but they, they engage us and they engage our imagination um, and they show us the, the, the possibilities um, for holiness. And that's one of the things that I really um, enjoy teaching when I teach about saint stories. And so we're going to be discussing a little bit tonight about um, some of the great saints in our tradition uh, who move us, who challenge us, um, who call us um, to become um, deeper lovers of Christ. Um, and it's very, and so, and, and of course, above all, that's our blessed, our blessed, uh, our Blessed Virgin Mother Mary. And so we'll, we'll begin there. I do have a little PowerPoint to show, and I hope that that will be okay. I'm gonna try and share my screen. Let's see. If this goes off without a glitch, then uh, the saints have definitely given us their assistance because of course there's always a chance that everything falls apart. Here we go. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, man. Can you see that? Can you see that? Yes. It's, oh, yeah. Okay, excellent. And I'm going to just um, <clears throat> do this. There we go. Okay. Perfect. So herons of the Syriac tradition. Um, this is what we're going to be thinking about tonight. And I'm going to show you that, of course, Mary is important um, in, in the Catholic tradition, in the Eastern and Western tradition. She is um, of utmost importance. Um, and 
I'm going to show you, however, uh, and discuss how the Syriac tradition, the, the Syriac tradition of which, of course, your Maronite, beautiful Maronite tradition is a direct heritage, um, has something very special and, and wonderful to, to teach us about Mary, a distinct voice indeed. And so my hope is that you can have a bit of um, enthusiasm and appreciation, fresh eyes to look at your, your, your own um, roots in, uh, through, through her person. Um, now, let's see, let's go. Uh, having, oh, here we go. Okay, this is a, an icon, a modern icon of, uh, of the Virgin in Syriac. So it says, uh, Betulso Mariam Yoldath Aloho here in Syriac. And then down here, Moran Alohan Yeshua Mishiho, our Lord um, Jesus Christ. And then the mother, so here you can see um, her name, uh, Betulsa, meaning Virgin, Miriam, Mother, Yoldoth Aloho, the bearer of God. And right here, um, it's, it's a very important, um, it's a very important um, thing to recall that the, that the icons in the church are more than just pictures. They're more than just illustrations. They teach us. They um, they teach us a theological lesson. And there is so much here contained. We could spend the whole lecture just looking at this beautiful icon. Um, but here, the iconographer has already told us a lot just in her title, the Tulsa. So she is virgin, but she is also the Yoldoth Aloho, the, the mother, the bearer of God. So right here in the person of Mary expressed in the Syriac, you have the uh, central reason why we venerate her above all people, that she um, is the woman whom God chose to carry his son above all women. And she is at the center of the great the most important paradox um, and, and the central doctrine of our Catholic tradition of the incarnation, that God loves us so much that in order to restore our human nature that had fallen in, into sin and that was sick with the effects um, of sin, um, the way to heal that was through God, the second person, the word of God, second person of the Trinity, becoming flesh, becoming incarnate, um, in the person of Jesus Christ. And the incarnation happens because of Our Lady. All of our salvation rested on Mary's decision to say yes to God. And so, of course, we venerate her. And so, of course, we hold her in such high regard. This is, this is so important. And when, you start, when we start to understand the whole richness of, of the teachings about Mary, um, it puts everything into this into um, a very humbling light because it's more than just a habit. It's more than just some, some funny Catholic thing. Oh, these Catholics do these things about Mary. No, if you see the whole reason why we venerate her, of course we're going to. Um, the paradox centered in her person that, uh, that God would choose not a wealthy woman, not a queen, not an empress, not a woman of power, but a poor girl from a peasant little village in Galilee, that he would choose her to carry his son is this incredible paradox. And what's uh, and, and that she says yes, that in, in the Syriac tradition, there's a wonderful, rich um, uh, uh, tradition of what are called dialogue poems. So dialogue poems is this uh, liturgical form where two characters from the Bible argue about points of theology. And in the ancient church, these would have been performed by choirs antiphonally, one side of the choir, one choir saying one thing and then the other one responding. So it was, a, uh, it was through the liturgy that the, that the theology was instructed to the laity. That's, that was the way that these things got passed down. And so one of the, one of those are really rich in the Syriac tradition heritage of these dialogue poems where Mary argues with Gabriel. And I love these poems. They are fantastic because it shows this young girl of 12 arguing with an angel before she says yes. Before she says yes, she wants to really know what she's getting into. And so the Syriac tradition makes 
a, a big deal um, really accentuates Mary's free will, Heriutha in Syriac. That is central. Why? Well, the reason why is that, that so that God would never push her. God gave her the chance to use her free will to come um, to follow his plan, but it wasn't coercion. And part of that tradition, the reason why that is so important has to do actually with, I'll go back to this, that slide too, with, with the, what, what's known in Syriac as the Eve Mary typology. So typology is this word that has to do with symbolism in scripture and theology. The idea that, um, that, that uh, stories in the Bible um, in the Old Testament, which we call as Christians the Old Testament, came to fulfillment in the new, that all the things that were to happen with the coming of Jesus actually were foreshadowed or prefigured in the Old Testament times. And so you can, you, you read the past through that lens. And in the case of Eve and Mary, it's profoundly rich. Um, and it goes a little something like this. Basically, in the story of Adam and Eve, as we know, uh, God creates Adam, and then Adam's lonely, he wants a helpmate, and then uh, God, God creates all the animals. We talked about the naming of the animals uh, at the Maronite uh, talk that I was at last, uh, last month. Anyway, Adam names the animals as a sign of, of his authority over them, but none of these animals suit Adam. They are not his equal, and so God creates Eve. Um, and he creates Adam and Eve, he creates humanity with free will. That's what's different. That free will that God made us with is what distinguishes us above all other creation. Creation is good. The other, the, the plants, the universe, the animals, it's all beautiful. It's, it's very beautiful. But um, humans are distinct because of what makes us the image and likeness of God, part of, part of what makes us the image and likeness of God is that God made us uh, free gave us this capacity to share in the governorship and the stewardship of his creation. But what happens, of course, is that Eve gets tricked by the serpent. Um, they had Adam and Eve had this wonderful, loving relationship with God. But at, at Eve and they had everything. They had everything. They enjoyed peace. They enjoyed a lack of labor. They enjoyed a lack of pain. Man did not have to work by the sweat of his brow, women were not suffering the pains of childbirth. They enjoyed this, but then Eve disobeys um, this command to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so she misuses her free will and she gets tricked. And hence um, humanity, we call it in the West falls. Uh, it's interesting in Eastern Christianity, they tend to, they, they tend to look at that moment more like a, a trip, like two little kids tripped and they and they scratched their knee they weren't necessarily trying to do something profoundly depraved they just made a mistake but unfortunately that mistake has this the sickness and then humanity becomes sick with this inclinations towards sin and so mary then comes as the opposite the typological fulfillment she's the inversion of of um of eve she uh also it's really interesting because the serpent whispers in, into Eve's ear to tempt her. And then the Syrian fathers say, in the same way, the angel Gabriel whispers into Mary's ear. So you can see here this picture of, of, um, of Mary's ear. Mary says yes to God. And then the Holy Spirit enters into her ear. And that is and, and then the conception of the incarnation takes place through her ear. It's a beautiful, again, uh, the typologic typology that sin comes into the world through the disobedience um, of one woman. And now the restoration will come through the yes of another. And so, um, so both of these icons capture this. This is a medieval one. Um, from This is the Gabriel and then Mary. This is a modern one. But I absolutely love everything about this beautiful modern icon because it captures again so much um, about the theology. I'm looking and seeing it's already 720. I can't believe this. 
well, <laughs> sorry, I could no, be okay. chatting yeah, too much. Going. You're good. Okay. No, you're good. All right. All right. Uh, so you can see here that Mary is looking with total compassion and love upon her ancestor, Eve, her mother, and, and poor Eve. I mean, this crestfallen expression, I just love this. And then down here, you have the serpent and Mary is squashing the head of that serpent. Um, so it's just the, everything that's contained. And of course, she's holding Eve's hand to her womb, which is carrying Jesus. And so everything is contained in this picture. I mean, you could do a whole sermon on this picture alone. It would teach so much. And this this is the theology that is so beautifully um, elaborated upon by the Syrian fathers in particular. So they have, in fact, there's many scholars who think that, um, I'll show you, this is an early icon actually of the Blessed Virgin Mary from the Ascension. This is from the Rabula Gospels, um, which is a very early, it's, sorry, it's an illuminated manuscript of, um, of uh, the ascension and you can see Mary in the middle and you can see how she is front and center. She is very much the object uh, that we're supposed to be reflecting and viewing upon. And it's a very interesting, um, wonderful image. And many scholars think actually that devotion to Mary probably came from Asia Minor, um, from, what is, from what were the Syriac speaking communities and grew from there. Um, even more, that the Syriac church always, from the beginning, had a very rich in, uh, understanding of who Mary was. They have, we know her through scripture, of course, but the Mary of the, of the Gospels, um, with the, perhaps the exception of the Gospel of Luke, which develops her person a lot more, isn't as fully of a portrait. And, you know, she, it's the church which develops this, who she is in this great tradition, the Syrian fathers in particular. And as I said, uh, here uh, earlier, they Ephraim the Syrian, who is the great poet of the Syriac tradition, makes a lot about uh, discussing how Mary um, was a poor girl. And in later um, traditions, which you see, uh, especially with Jacob of Seruj, who was another Syriac poet from the sixth century, there is another um, element to her person that Mary is also an advocate for women who have been mistreated and um, unfairly because of being unfairly judged. And so but the tradition that nobody would have this, they imagine how hard it must have been for Mary to be found with child and to explain that this child was um, through the, you know, through, through the, through the Holy Spirit, conceived through the Holy Spirit, and how difficult that must have been for her. Of course, Joseph wanted to divorce her. So there's that whole tradition. Syrian fathers take that little nugget in scripture and elaborate upon it and say, indeed, Mary stands for all women who have been falsely accused from a, from a misunderstood pregnancy or, 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 or mistreated. And so I, I just, I really appreciate the strength and the power that they, that they put into the, the Syrian fathers, put into their female um, characters. Mary is also in the poetry of Ephraim, the one who teaches all Christians how to approach Jesus. And so there's a beautiful, um, this is another image from the Rabula Gospels of, of, of the, the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary. And again, Mary is standing right in the middle. She is absolutely the most important, um, I'll go back here too. You can take a look here. I, I was going to discuss about, uh, about the Syriac language, um, but I'll just say a few words before, and I'll go back to Mary. Syriac, just as, as, um, as, a, as a note, um, is a dialect of Aramaic that was spoken in the area of, of the world, which is now known as Southeast Turkey. So the center of the Syriac speaking world in, in, in the ancient world, the late ancient world was the city of Edessa, which is now called San Orfa. And I can show you briefly, real quick, if you want here for a second, um, I will show you just a map and then, and I promise you, we'll get back to Mary. But I did. I think maps can be helpful sometimes. That's my daughter, by the way, when she was a baby. <laughs> She's four now. Um, here is Syriaca.org. Can you see this? Okay. 
yeah, okay. Um, so this is a, a database for Syriac studies that my colleagues and I have put together. And one of the things that we have, which we're really proud of all, all of these modules, but the place one is really terrific. And I love teaching, this is really great. Um, if you want to illustrate where places are. So just as a, a map uh, module database. So this is Edessa. So just so you can see, this was the center of the Syriac world here. Dr. Jean, and, yes. I wanted to let you know right now what we're seeing is your PowerPoint slide. What is Syriac? Oh, you're not seeing this. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry about that. Let me switch over. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hang on one second. Uh, let's see. New share. Okay, let's try this. There. There. Yes. Can you see that now? Okay. Um, thank you. Sorry. Um, and um, and so this is the map of 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 Edessa. There's a little person who's just walked in the room. Here, do you want to say hi? Can we get a gift back? This is my son, Damien. Hi, oh, hi Damien. <laughs> hi, right, Damien. Yes. <laughs> He's fine. <laughs> God Can you close you. the door, please? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, okay, here is Edessa. So this is um, northern Mesopotamia. And as I said, this was the center of, of the Syriac-speaking world. And so you can play around if you want some time with syriaca.org and, and see the resources that we have there. Okay, I go back now to my, to my PowerPoint. Okay. And we will go back uh, to Mary. So Syriac then like, was this was a dialect of Aramaic spoken around uh, spoken around Edessa, but it spread further um, in uh, throughout the Middle East, um, and and it is of course the late the heritage language of your own Maronite tradition. Um, okay, I wanted to say it's since we're running, it's already. Um, 7.28 my time, 8.28 your time. I wanted to just say a few more words about some other female saints in addition to Mary. So Mary is the most important. Hopefully now you can understand. And oh, there was one more point I wanted to share about Ephraim. Ephraim wrote a beautiful cycle of hymns called the hymns, St. Ephraim, uh, the hymns on the nativity. And one of the most wonderful things that Ephraim does in these hymns is that he creates speech for Mary because Mary doesn't say that much. She has her hymns. She has the Magnificat. But of course, she must have said a lot more than that, right? And so Ephraim imagines what she said to her child when she was um, holding him for the first time and the wonder that must have been for her to be holding the incarnate God, the sheer paradox of the, of the entire story. So he's a beautiful um, theology of wonder that Mary is the one who teaches us how to approach her son in love and in wonder. Um, so the, the stories of the saints then at their center have the teaching of the incarnation. God becomes flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. God becomes human. But the other part of that, the challenge is humans can therefore become like God. So God becomes human so that humans can become like God. This is what the saints teach us. What does it mean to become like God? What does it mean to become like God? The saints show us different ideas, different models. There's not only one way to become like God. There are different avenues to holiness. Martyrdom isn't for everyone. It can't be for everyone, as we know, right? And so the stories of the saints give us, um, and and so women throughout in the sto stories of the saints are always figuring either as the central figures or sometimes also as the mother or sisters of saints. And so you see women in in various capacities. You just have to um, be aware, you know, that's part of becoming sensitive um, to the presence of women in these stories is, is one of the ways that we can resurrect what women's history in the church actually was, was is just by sort of attending to that. Um, one of my favorite saints uh, was Saint Febronia of Nisibis. She, so Nisibis is a city uh, which is also 
today um, in Turkey. It's on the Turkish-Syrian border, New Sibin, it's called today. And Febronia was a nun. Um, she, in the story, um, there is a convent in Nisibis. And um, it's a beautiful account of female piety about what consecrated virgins living together, practicing um, a life of devotion to God, of prayer and fasting and scholarship. And so it's really interesting. The story describes very much how important learning was to the women. In fact, what's, what's remarkable about the life of St. Febronia is that it was one of the only saints' lives purported to have been written by a woman. So we don't have a lot of texts actually written by women, but the life of Febronia is an exception, um, purportedly written by one of her fellow sisters. So, uh, so that's kind of a, a fascinating um, tidbit right there. And um, so she, she, uh, lived in the period of Diocletian according to tradition. So this is the end of the fourth, so beginning of the fourth century. Um, and the, the last persecution in the Roman empire against Christians. There was before the edict of Milan in 313, there, it, there was, it was illegal to be a Christian. Um, and so there were times when persecutions would break out. And this is how, we have this uh, rich heritage of the martyrs. So men and women who refused to renounce their faith, um, who, chose, who chose death instead. And so Febronia is part of that tradition because she indeed was martyred. So she, um, as I said, oops, this is actually, go back there. This is a Greek icon of Hagia Febronia. So Febronia, although she is, a Syriac woman, a, a woman of the Syriac tradition, she's actually um, venerated by Greeks as well, as well as by the, the Latin church. I'll be showing you that in a second. But the story uh, describes her life um, and uh, the other sisters celebrated Febronia for her learning. They call her the teacher. So she is held up even as a young woman, as a very intelligent woman, a scholar. She's a scholar, she's a teacher and, um, and, and a great lover of, of Christ. She's also very beautiful. And in the story, when the persecution breaks out, the, um, the pagan bad guys, for lack of a better term, come and storm the convent. Febronia's sisters um, want, want to flee, but Febronia is very brave and says, no, we need to stay here and fight these guys off and, and stand up for our faith. So she's, she is um, constructed as a woman of, of, of tremendous spiritual strength um, and resolve and courage. Um, and, and so uh, they capture her and they say, well, we won't kill you if you agree to renounce your Christianity and marry the son of the emperor um, and become a pagan. So she says, absolutely not. And so then they 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 arrest her they, and they martyr her in a very gruesome way. And the story is um, rather shocking. If you were to ever read the story, you can find, there's a wonderful text. I can send you this uh, reference later, um, sister, and then you can pass it on to the audience. Holy Women of the Syrian Orient is a wonderful collection of, of saints' lives about women from the Syriac tradition, translated by Sebastian Brock and my, um, my teacher, Susan Ashbrook Harvey. So it's a wonderful question. Her life is in there. Um, and so it describes the, the ways that she's tortured and th there is a brutality, the brutality is tremendous and her resolve and her bravery um, and, and she's killed. And after she's killed, uh, there's a very interesting, strange um, conflict that erupts between the sisters her sisters and the bishop, because the local bishop wants her relics and the sisters want her relics. And so it's this kind of interesting little glimpse into how important the saints were already in the time. They say, she was our sister. We deserve to have her relics. And the bishop says, yes, but she belongs to the church. Uh, she belongs to the community. We want the relics. And so you have this almost like a competition going on. Luckily, um, they compromise 
and the bishop gets a tooth and the sisters get the rest of her body. So there you have it. <laughs> uh, it's kind of interesting. But she uh, is um, also venerated in Italy. So her life, this picture here is from Southern Italy actually, from the town of Minori, south of Sorrento. So traditions about Febronia reach Southern Italy even. And so it's a very fascinating example of a, of a um, saint's life kind of spreading westward. So it went from the Syriac speaking world into the Greek speaking world into the Latin speaking world by about the eighth century. And um, very interesting to see how her uh, tradition was so appealing to people. And she gets adopted as the patroness actually of three cities in Southern Italy. She's the patroness of two cities in Sicily and one city in Southern Italy. And um, I had the, her feast day is at the end of June. And I had the opportunity to visit these cities in Italy many, many years ago now, 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And it was really interesting uh, to be there for the celebrations. They, they, they really love their Febronia and they know her story too. So it was, again, it's a neat kind of example of the Syriac tradition reaching uh, Italy. Um, this is another a shrine to her that was found in Teltenir in Syria, where the archaeologists um, found remnants of a monastic complex from the sixth century. And the this tree is dedicated to Febronia, and these little pieces of of um, cloth represent petitions. And so there's still very much. And also, when they excavated, they found a reliquary of her tooth. And so that's really am amazing. Um, the tooth, of course, is mentioned in the saint's life. As I said, the bishop gets the tooth of, of, of St. Febronia. And then here you have this reliquary holding, which purportedly you know, held the tooth of Febronia. So it's an amazing kind of example of every once in a while, the you know, from a historical point of view, the, the, the literature, the literary, the traditions, work well with what archaeologists found with the material culture. Um, and these are some pictures of, this is Palagonia in Sicily. This is St. Febronia again. So as I said, they have these wonderful uh, traditions of, of celebrating her. Um, Palagonia and then also Pati, another city. And, um, oh, we haven't talked about Mary, but yeah. And then another one is, is Minori. Um, and, uh, I will say also then a few, we'll say a few, I'll, I'll try and wrap things up here in about 10 minutes. Does that sound good? I'll talk about two more saints. Does that, does that yeah. work with you? Okay. Go as long as you need to, you're good. Okay, all yeah. right, um, very good. This is, I wanted to talk a little bit too about St. Mary of Egypt, whom some of you may know. She um, is not a Syriac saint, but she's very important. She gets appropriated into the Syriac tradition. Very, very popular saint from uh, the Eastern Byzantine tradition, Greek tradition, uh, but her life was also written, uh, translated into Syriac. Um, and she is part of a tradition of female saints known as the penitent harlots. These are women who had been prostitutes, who were prostitutes, and then who experienced a tremendous conversion. So St. Mary, according to her tradition, was a prostitute in the city of Alexandria, Egypt. Um, and she's presented as a, um, you know, the, the, for lack of a better word, the embodiment of, of pleasures of the flesh. She um, indulges in all things which are connected to desire and lust. She likes her profession so much that she's happy to do it even for free. So she's kind of like, the, the story really like magnifies all this stuff about her, but she gets on a boat um, to, that's bound for the Holy Land at the, on the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross in the month of September. She arrives in Jerusalem um, and has this conversion experience. She tries to, to step into the church, but a force is holding her back. So she literally cannot cross the threshold of the church. And so at that moment, 
she's she stopped in her place and she has an experience of of total penitence of total sorrow and awareness of the life that she's been leading and um a desire for god's mercy and a desire for god's forgiveness and so she has a vision of the Blessed Mary, the Theotokos, the, the Old of Aloha, coming to her and speaking with her. So it's like Mary, St. Mary, um, and the Virgin Mary speak, the Marys talking to each other. And she makes a pledge to the Virgin that she will change her ways, that she will give herself to God, and that she will not um, indulge in anything of the body of the body or the flesh anymore. And so what she does then is to flee. She flees into the desert with um, a small bag of food and lives out there for 30 or 40 years by herself. And, um, and, and, and that's part of the mystery or the miracle connected to St. Mary was that God sustained her in this way. Um, so as you can see from her picture, she's presented here as an ascetic. So the ascetics are the men and women who practice uh, taming of the body um, and through, through fasting and practicing. Um, and so she's she looks like John the Baptist. You know, she looks like a prophet. She looks more like a man than a woman. And so it's interesting how the picture teaches us that. It, um, there's no sign of her female body here. She's just an emaciated form. And what happens in the story, which is so beautiful, is that there's a monk named Father Zosimus in the story. And he's revered for being a very wonderful monk. And he's struggling because all the other monks tell him how great he is. And so he thinks, well, maybe I am great. And so he's tempted to pride. He's tempted to thinking, that there's no room for him to grow spiritually. So he flees the monastery to go in search of a better monk, a, a holier man, for lack of a better word. And he goes into the desert and he meets Mary. And he doesn't know what she is. He literally thinks she's an animal when he first sees her. She's been at this point out in the desert so long that her body is blackened by the sun. He thinks she's a man, she's naked. Um, but she knows who he is. And so part of the beauty of the story is God is giving Mary these miraculous insights into knowing who Zosimus is. And she says, you know, Father, get back for me. I'm a woman. I need to cover myself. He lends her his cloak. She covers himself. And he begs her then to tell him her story. He calls it this life-giving story. Do not withhold from me your life-giving story, mother. He calls her mother, mother Mary. And so it's a beautiful story. Then she confesses to him really is what it is. It's a confession then of, uh, to this priest. And, and she tells him everything about her life. And he's amazed. And, and you have this all of a sudden too, this beautiful reversal of a relationship between a man and a woman. So here's Mary who had been a prostitute and had one type of relationship before with men. And now she has this beautiful friendship uh, in, based on the love of God with this priest, Zosimus, who's absolutely humbled by her, who is absolutely convinced that she, of, of her holiness and, and moved and touched by her. And he, she begs him to perform the Eucharist. They share the liturgy. So the first meal that she has then is the Eucharistic meal with Sazimus. He goes back to the monastery. She promised, she asked him to return. When he returns to the desert, she has died. And poor Zazimus <laughs> has to ask a lion to help him bury the body. So it's a, it's a profound, and the, the lion does, because when animals, like wild animals, behave like pets, behave tame like a pet, um, it's a sign of a of a saint. That's what animals do when they're in the presence in saint size in the presence of a holy person. It's no wonder why that story is so beautiful and, and so loved. It was translated into multiple languages in the ancient church, and she is the icon of penance, of what you do when you take your love and your passion and you redirect it to God. It's because the image of the penitent harlot is an image of misdirected love. 
It's this love, it's this passion, it's this love, that, this capacity and this desire that we all have to be loved that's gone totally wrong. And so through her experience of God's mercy, she redirects that love to God and becomes a great saint. And also it's this challenge. If she can do it, then so can we. Um, so Mary is both a comfort and a challenge. Um, and so dramatic, as I say, dramatic sinning and dramatic conversion. And, and, and as I said, these types of, of stories are very, very, re really popular in the ancient world. This is, a, I'll just show you then these, a couple other pictures. There's Mary talking, speaking here, promising herself to the Virgin. And I love, this is a, um, a Coptic icon. Here's Mary here uh, with, with Sosimus receiving the, um, receiving the Eucharist. meeting and departure. And it's interesting that she's not really as popular in the West. I don't know why that is. I don't know why her story, why devotion to St. Mary of Egypt didn't sort of explode in the same way in the Western church as it did in, in the Eastern churches. Um, that's actually kind of an interesting thing to ponder, I suppose. But in any case, um, this is one icon of her or one statue of her from France here with her hair down. And this is a um, Armenian icon. So she's in the middle here and you can see the story of her life in these little pictures. Um, and so uh, it's interesting too, that there were shrines connected to women and female saints that, that people would travel to, um, to, 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 get, to get blessings. And there's, we have a lot of objects like this that archeologists have found. This is one, for St. Thecla here, this little um, pilgrim's token here that you would take sacred oil, holy oil from the, the saint's shrine and um, receive a blessing. And I'll show you this at St. Thecla, this will be my last one, I think. Um, St. Thecla came from the city of Antioch um, on the Orontes, which is um, between Syria. It's in Turkey today, but it's right on the Syrian border. Of course, this is a very important city. Uh, to Christian histories where the people were first called Christians. And St. Thecla is a disciple of um, Paul, St. Paul. So according to the story, St. Thecla, who was a pagan girl, betrothed to a very high-born pagan man um, from an important family, she heard the preachings of Paul and she is moved to conversion. She wants to be an apostle too. And she falls in love with Paul's message. Um, so she cuts her hair and she becomes an apostle. So there's a beautiful sort of interesting image of, of this woman cutting off her hair and dressing up like a man, actually, because she wants to protect herself. If you're going to go out on the road uh, in this time by yourself as a woman, you would have needed to protect yourself. So that's what she does. And it's and it's like the story of a superwoman. She does everything. She's performing miracles. She's baptizing. She's doing amazing things all on her own, all the, through the, and she actually baptizes herself too, which is an, it's an extraordinary kind of moment in the story. Um, and, and she is saved from all types of attempts to, to, to kill her. So God protects her and that's part of her miracle. And St. Thecla was highly, um, highly venerated by women in the ancient church. And she still is today, St. Thecla. And, um, in Syria, and uh, it, she was so popular that some of the early church fathers actually didn't really like it. They said the women, the you know, Christian women, like the Stekla story too much. We need to we need to not circulate the story too much. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic, social dynamic there too. So I'm going to stop there, and um, just to say, I'm I'm sorry if I was chit chatting too long. I could go on and on, but um, I know that we want to have some time for conversations. And so happy to chat with you further about anything you like. So thank you. Um, you're a true teacher. <laughs> you really are. You're very interesting to listen to. And maybe at this point, what we could do is we could stop the share and we can go to yep. our gallery. Um, yep. Let me see if I can figure this out then. Stop share. Stop share. Okay. Yes. How's that? Good? Very good. Yes, very good. Okay.
Thank and you, I, everyone. Yes, I have to say the saints that you did mention were very interesting and very, um, I'm sure that the story that you could go more and more into um, their virtues and their qualities, but you definitely give, gave us a taste of, of their lives and especially the beautiful imagery too of Mary and how you had that um, icon of her with Eve. I thought mm -hmm. that was special and the contrast, you know, the, the new Eve and the mother Eve, you know, the first Eve. So um, I, I want to kind of open it up and I want to give people an opportunity if they have any questions. Uh, I really feel like the saints are beautiful role models for us in our own journey because we're all called to holiness and we're all called to um, love God and, and love our neighbor in making a gift of ourselves. So with that being Can said, yes, mother has I'll a question. I'll go first while people sure. put their questions in the chat box. Yes. <laughs> um, we were talking about this today and I was talking to a priest about it and um, a Roman Catholic priest. There are in the Syriac tradition and I think in others uh, of women in the early church entering male monasteries and disguising themselves as men to be able to enter. And as you were saying, St. Tecla had to uh, disguise herself as a man to be able to, to walk the, the, through the towns and byways to preach. Um, why was that though? Because to the modern mind, well, maybe to the modern mind, it sounds fine, but I, <laughs> to the modern Catholic mind, it sounds so peculiar. So um, are you asking about uh, saints who like who dress up like men and entered into the monasteries? Uh, that... uh, yes. Like yeah. yeah, like Marina, right? I was, thinking, I was thinking of Marina. Yeah, it is a really... Um, it is a fascinating um, tradition, um, and it gets us into a little bit of a, a, a little bit of um, shaky ground sometimes in trying to understand how much of those stories actually reflect historical reality versus were they what, what what's the point that they were trying to teach? Um, so in the case of Marina. Um, uh, uh, I mean, it's obvious why men, you know, wouldn't want women in their monastery. I mean, they were seeking uh, sort of, you know, solitary devotion to God. And, and, and um, uh, but um, the story of Marina is, is remarkable because um, her mother dies and her father wants to join the monastery. So in this case, uh, she is a little girl who kind of kind of grows up in the monastery with her father but then he has to disguise her as as a boy i recall and um and then they think that she is a boy and then a woman actually accuses marina of raping her and getting her pregnant so there's this bizarre you know story because that's a common story in the in the uh, uh motif in in hagiography too that monks will get accused of raping women, um, and it the, it becomes this sort of thing. Well, what what do you what what what's going to happen here? Marina, of course, as a woman, it's it's altogether impossible. I mean, there's no um, for obvious reasons, you know. So every so the audience knows this, and so um, seeing her response then is the is the point because what what she does is she takes it on. She she doesn't. Um, try to run away from this accusation. She she offers to care for the child, so it's this it's an Im, it's a it's an image of profound humility, profound. Just I'm not even sure what 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 the word is, but it's shocking that she would react that way, right? Because it's so different from what we would expect. Um, and so I I think a lot of times the, the stories of these of these women, the sort of playing with, with gender identities and um, all of these things, what they're trying to do, I think, as much as some of this, maybe, maybe, maybe some of this did happen, we just don't know, but it's certainly trying to shake up whatever people's expectations were of holiness. Because in the, in the early church, because it comes in the ancient world, it was always expected that the man was the paragon of virtue, of strength, of self-control. So women were always presented as weak, 
emotionally persuasive, persuasive um, lacking, you know, you couldn't trust a woman, deceitful, all the, all the negative stuff. And so what these female saints then do is challenge all of that when they are, they then show that they're actually much stronger than a lot of the men around them. And so I think, I think it's maybe, may, you know, part, part of that, that it's supposed to, um, Christianity appealed to women in the earliest church because there was always, um, for lack of a better word, an, an emphasis on justice between the sexes. Not that we were the same, but there was, but that, that we were called to a type of justice that hadn't been, that hadn't been sort of possible before. Um, that you didn't have to be confined to, um, yeah, you, you know, your father's control, your husband's control. That you're, that you were, that, that you, everyone was called to a life of holiness. Um, and so, Christian, and so there's there's a reason why Christianity was so popular in the earliest days with women. We know that for a fact, because th there are pagan sources that are putting Christians down. The early Christians, oh, it's, you know, it's just this horrible, you know, all the scum of the earth become, they're the Christians, you know, they, they attract women, they attract slaves, you know, it's like a gathering place for all these negative things. There was a little bit of truth to that, but that was because there was this egalitarian appeal possibilities so I don't really answer your question directly mostly because I'm not really sure um but monasteries there there were things that were that were I mean we know sometimes from the archaeological evidence we know that there were children living in monasteries because they found kids skulls there we know that there were uh not typical sort of familial situations necessarily have it you know I mean there was there was a space for some of that and then, of course, female monasteries are going to develop in their own right and convents, too. Okay. Thank you for that. We actually had a question in the chat from before. I'm yes. Looking at it um, from Summer. How to, how to approach Protestants in regards to veneration? Mm -hmm. the yes. Conception, assumption, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's one of the most misunderstood um, uh, sort of uh, differences between Protestants and Catholics classically is our approach to Mary and the saints. And frankly, some of that is, um, is there's, there's a bit of, we can sort of understand, you know, why, why some of that is. There's a history for some of this. Um, as Mary became more, venerated in the church that um for some people uh, i think her appeal was so she becomes you know the mother she becomes this advocate she becomes everything and then for some people it was almost more approachable than christ himself you know and so there was this possibility that devo devotion to mary became almost too much you know because of course she was never you were we were never supposed to worship mary you're supposed to honor her, venerate her. So that's that's the theological classical distinction is that no, we only worship God, we only pray to God, we don't pray to Mary, we ask Mary to pray for us. Big distinction. But a lot of Catholics in my own tradition, I mean, I'm Roman Catholic, a lot of Catholics don't necessarily know enough to fine tune it that way, they might not necessarily. So, I mean, um. I mean, I, I would say that's that's the that's the easiest way to say is well, what, the veneration is because of her unique role, um, and the reason we believe that 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 she um, was preserved from the effects of original sin was because God had to have a perfect person to carry His Son. It, it, she had to she 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 had to be a virgin because how else? How else is this going to make sense? God can't have a human father, right? And and so, but he has to have a human mother, but his human mother must be perfect. And um, and so it's, but, it, but she's a paradoxical image. And so that's the thing. She is human, um, but she's like no other human that has ever lived. Um, so I would say, but it's also this, the idea to the veneration is that because we believe that the saints are with God, the communion of saints is part of the teachings of the church. They are our great advocates. They stand before Christ. They advocate for Christ. We believe that their prayers are powerful. They pray for us. That's why we ask them to pray for us. 
and um, and and we need their prayers and. And so it's all tied up. It's all tied up into that. But yes, there in in time there has been lots of room for um, exaggeration, uh, and also too when the in the human element, people being what they are, people have always liked a good party, and you know the saints have always been attract like associated also with feast days, as you know, with feast days, um, all the saint every saint has a feast day. And then that unfortunately sometimes would divulge into sort of a little bit too much, you know? And so people would say, what are you guys just having these big parties, you know, for the saints? And so it's a bit of the human element in there too. Um, um, so we have all these traditions, but you could tell your Protestant friends too, that it's not that a lot of these teachings go back to the ancient church, they're not new. So if you go back to the history, they are old. I mean, these things go back centuries 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 very good well sama wrote thank you um and she also said um i would love uh, your contact <laughs> okay <laughs> certainly saint shmuni is someone went to oh is that okay. should i answer that? that yeah sure yeah Go. i'd be happy to talk about shmuni she is really interesting um one of my graduate students who's a, he a hebrew bible student um, actually is working on her uh, figure. Shmuni is the mother of the Maccabees. And uh, she was a really popular um, saint in the early church. And she's unusual because as you write, um, Mr. Tabit, that, uh, that it's, you know, she's from the Old Testament. So she lived before the coming of Jesus, but her bravery and her devotion to God and her willingness to even sacrifice her children for the sake of their fidelity to God's commandments is seen as a foreshadowing of what the martyrs do. So Shmuni is seen as this great woman. St. Gregory of Nazianzus, the Greek father, said that she had the faith of Father Abraham. So she's held up as good as, 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 as important as one of the prophets, which is amazing. And um, and so she takes uh, her her story just becomes um, um, e expounded upon with with in, in in very interesting ways in the Syriac tradition, um, and it, of course it's a very popular name um, in the Syriac churches for for girls, and there are a lot of homilies and stories that that develop about Saint Shmuni and why she is held up as the the perfect um, mother who is also a perfect lover of God. And it's interesting because she's in the story again, and there's this, there's this playing with this expectation. How would you expect a woman whose kids are about to be executed to be reacting? You'd expect her to be going crazy. You'd be expecting her to literally be pulling her hair out, screaming. And throughout the story, Shmuni is calm, She's encouraging her sons not to be brave. She is um, she is an icon of, of 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 courage and even sort of detachment. So she's so her faith is so strong that she is like incredibly astoundingly brave in those moments. And so, um, yeah, she she's she becomes an emblem of of a. Of, of what a Christian woman should be, but actually she wasn't a Christian at all. So it's a very, she's a fascinating character. And, and as I said, there's been a lot of, we can keep in touch with that because there's a lot of interesting scholarship right now that's being done on Shmuni. I think a lot of people are interested in her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, and I was just gonna write in the chat, uh, Maccabees, is, is that's where her story is. Uh, yes, Maccabees, yeah. Yes. So if you're interested in learning more about St. Shmuni and her sons, I highly recommend it. Very interesting. Awesome. Um, any other final questions before we wrap up with our closing prayer? I'm happy, by the way. Um, please, uh, Sister, give everyone my email. I'm happy to stay in touch. Um, sure. You know, I'm, I'm here in Milwaukee and, you know, happy to be in touch with any of you. <laughs> very good i might actually do that i might send them i might put it in the chat right now just so that those that want to be in contact with you can yeah certainly yeah so mm -hmm. on the call 
Are there um, anthologies? I know you said Sebastian Brock and and your mm -hmm. co-authored mm -hmm. really that Women of the Orient. Are there other uh, books similar to that? Uh, that well, uh, specifically on women, um, I think that's the main one. But um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot uh, of for instance, um, homilies on Mary that you can find. Um, I'm happy to um, put together. I can send you some information about bibliographies too. Um, mm -hmm. Like Jacob of Sarus has a lot of wonderful homilies on, on Mary and also female saints on the women who Jesus heals in scripture. He's got a, a, a tremendous, um, a tr you know, a, a tremendous um, Mariology and also images of female saints. And a lot of those homilies have now been translated too. Okay. <laughs> You're just getting some uh, gratitude notes, I think. Yeah, I see them. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Yes, God is good. All right, well, why don't we close up then with a, a beautiful prayer and just Thanksgiving. Um, we thought we'd offer a, a hymn to our Blessed Mother, but I, I want to also give Jean-Nicole, would you like to... Um, offer a prayer or anything certainly um uh dear lord i just want to offer a gratitude uh, for this sacred time to be with these wonderful people I ask you to bless uh their their lives um and their families and our community and pray for um unity among christians um and love and and respect and peace um and always uh strength to to trust in in God's love and and also to um to to be who we are as Christians in the world today. Amen. Amen. Oh Mary, we pray to you. Blessed and pure is one. Help us in our Seed and pray for us. Virgin Mother, show us love. May your Son, our Lord, grant us mercy through your prayers. Mary, Mother of the Light, pray for us. Pray for us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now, now and forever. forever. Amen. Amen.